All right, so what's going on here? Um, they give you this probability. You're like, start at 65, then go to somewhere. And you're like, what's the somewhere that I go to? Maybe the, um, maybe the probability density function tells me what my endpoint is. Except it doesn't. <laughs> the probability density function from memory, it just has this boundary on one side, and then it's got no boundary on the other side. Is that right? Yep. Now, here's where you really need to think carefully about what function you're integrating and what you can therefore know about it, even if, you, um, even if you're like not sure where this goes. Okay? Um, this function here, what might it look like, even vaguely? Have a think about this for a second. 15,000, x minus 50 on x to the power of 4. Now, what I know about it, what I noticed about it, and I want you to think back to graphing techniques. I know that was a little while ago. Okay? This is one of our rational functions. Do you remember with rational functions, um, actually with all functions, we had to look for a few particular features. Do you remember that? Um, we gave you like a little acronym for it, right? Um, we looked for the shape, we looked for intercepts. What was this guy? Do you remember what this one was? What does A stand for? A stands for asymptotes, right? Now asymptotes are particularly relevant when you look at exponentials, when you look at logarithms, or when you're looking at these guys, rational functions. Okay, and I know we went over that fairly quickly when we were doing the topics, so that's why I thought it's worth dwelling on now. Um, there are, broadly speaking, for us, there are two kinds of asymptotes, right? If I asked you to graph, say, 1 over x, can you, like, motion in the air with your pen? Like, what would 1 over x look like on the Cartesian plane? What's that thing going to look like? Well, we, like, this is, this is a shape we've known since year 10, right? Yeah, okay, good. This is um, this kind of hyperbola-looking shape, like so. Right? There are two asymptotes. Where are they? Yeah, I've actually conveniently already drawn them, right? I need another color here. Um, one is the y-axis. So it's a vertical asymptote. And then the other one is the x-axis, right? Okay. Now I want you to particularly think about, like we know where this um, x equals zero, this vertical axis, uh, sorry, asymptote comes from. It comes from the fact that you're not allowed to put zero into the denominator. And you're like, oh, it blows up, okay? But what about this one? Like, how do we know what's going on with the horizontal asymptote? I'm calling on knowledge from a while back, so I wonder, Max, what are you thinking? Something like, when you put like one over x over x over x? What? Say that again, Max? One over x over... I don't know, I don't oh, oh, I know what you're, yeah, 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 okay, so you're thinking about, um, <laughs> in this example it doesn't help, but um, you're thinking about dividing the top and the bottom <laughs> by the same power to try and like get rid of like what's, what's going on here. In this example it's not particularly helpful because you, you end up exactly back where you started, but in other examples it does work for you. What you're trying to do is, you're trying to understand, if I put in really, it's a simpler way of doing it, but it's a bit messy and dirty, if I put in really large values of x, in this direction, or, or in this direction for that matter. x equals 100, or x equals 1,000. These are some of the examples we actually did online, if you remember. Um, what, what's this thing doing as you get larger and larger values of x? Approaching zero. It's approaching zero, perfect, right? Which is why I've got this zero asymptote, right? Now I want you to use that kind of thinking on this guy, on our probability density function. What is happening when I'm putting bigger and bigger values of x into this guy? Hmm. It's also going to approach zero, isn't it? Um, and the reason is for exactly the same reason as this guy, right? Um, here, the denominator gets big, and the numerator just doesn't go anywhere, right? So if you've got a big denominator, your number is very tiny. Um, that's why you approach zero. The logic is slightly different here. Um, as x gets really big, the numerator does increase in size, but what's the denominator doing? In comparison, like think about this, right? So there's like a tug of war between the numerator and the denominator, right? In this case, the numerator is doing nothing. It's just sitting there. It's like, whee, denominator wins, okay? Now, this numerator, it's pulling, right? It's getting bigger, but what's the denominator doing? Getting really big. This is like me on the other end of a rope of a sumo wrestler, right? Like the sumo wrestler is going to win, okay? So the denominator gets huge. This whole function, what does it tend toward? J just like this guy, it tends towards zero. Does that make sense? Okay. So therefore, all of that to say, when you form your integral, right, and it's a bit sneaky, um, the notation here gets a bit flaky. Um, we're going to start at 65 and go to the right. Yeah, do you agree with that? Because you're like, I, I need to be greater than 65. But up the top here, just be very cautious with this, right? I'm trying to understand what happens when I go on forever and ever and ever. Does that make sense? 
Um, I use infinity as kind of like a shorthand for that. Infinity is not a number. I can't actually put it into my, my primitive once I get it. But we've just gone through a process of understanding. If you go to really, really large values, I know what this thing is doing. It's going towards zip. Does that make sense? So this is going to end up giving you, um, you get whatever. I, we haven't actually, well, it's going to be that, right? From 65 up to infinity, right? You'll put in your, um, that's the end point. You'll put in your f of 65 to do this. But then from this, we know what that's going to go toward. It's going to go to 0, isn't it? Does that make sense? Like this is what f of, if you could evaluate f of infinity and take infinity as if it were a number and pop it into your calculator, it would hand you back 0, the, the limit would anyway. Um, I can't, my calculator can't do that. But I know that's what it's supposed to do. And then I'm going to subtract, because that's what integrals do. Does that make sense? I don't think I did the most succinct job at explaining what we did before, right? What's the issue with this? Um, and also, um, thanks to Jermaine, what's, what's another way to have a go at this, right? Remember, set the scene, right? You've got some probability density function, right? It's defined in some way, but only in a certain domain, from 50 and then off you go, right? Now, then they present you this and you're like, hmm, that's a bit strange because I'm going to go from 65 onwards, but then this guy doesn't tell you, oh, you ended 100 or you ended 1,000. It just seems to keep on going forever in that direction, right? So how do we deal with this? Um, the first method, which we sort of talked about before is, um, and it's, it's a little bit sneaky, you start at 65 because that's the, the leftmost part of it, right? But that you, you imagine or you take the limit of what happens as you go to infinity. I just need to emphasize again, infinity is not a number that we're actually putting in, but we know how it behaves as we get close to infinity. So you get this, right? Now, because you can't just put in infinity, you run into some problems when you try this next step, right? You're like, oh, what do I do for my upper boundary? But we said for this particular function, you have to look closely at what probability density function you've got. As you get closer to infinity, you just get closer to zero. Okay, so that's going to be your f of infinity, your upper bound, and then you do your lower bound, and then off you go. Okay, you'll get an answer out of this, and I double checked uh, for missing a 15,000 in my working. Um, this does give you the correct answer. But there's another way to do it. Remember that even though this looks a bit weird, the rest of the probability, like before 65 um, and after 50, that part is very well defined, right? From 50 to 65, I could work that out quite easily. Now, the reason why it's handy to work out that probability from 50 to 65 is because after 65 and before 65 covers your entire probability. Does that make sense? That's everything, right? So therefore, that's 1. Do you agree? The entire probability in the situation has to be 1. So this probability plus this probability, that should equal to a known value. It should equal 1. So if this is the thing I'm actually after, all I have to do is just rearrange and subtract this from both sides. Does that make sense? I'm going to find my desired probability by saying it's 1, take away this particular integral in here. And we have a name for this when we think about probabilities. Uh, when you've got two probabilities that add up to the entire situation, right? What's the probability of rain and the probability of not rain? They add up to 1. We call these two things complementary. Do you remember that idea? Um, complement with an E. Okay, that's important enough that I should write it down. So this method in here also works and what's great about it is you don't have to fuss around with this weirdness of infinity in here. I will just put a note in as to why you might still care about this and you'll see why on exactly the next line. What happens when you go to evaluate this guy? Well this is just a normal integral so I'm going to go from um, 50 up to 65 and I want you to notice what happens on my next line of working. It's one takeaway and then you evaluate both boundaries, yeah? So in this case it'll be f of 65 take away f of 50. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now um, I've got some double negatives here so I'll just tidy up a teeny little bit but I just want to put the point of contrast between this line and this line. You will, I promise, you will get the same answer out both ways. Mrs. Lees and I checked. 
But if you think back to the original question, what this actual thing was and the primitive you get out of it, um, it's really gross. It's like a pain to put into your calculator. And often these functions are, right? So you can see that the, the slight edge that this method has is that you just don't have to do two boundaries. Or, or you did one boundary and you know it ends up being zero. Okay, so in terms of a work minimization, um, the amount of working you put down is, is very small. Um, this concept is actually a really good way to do it because it tackles what we know about probability and both absolutely work. Okay, um, but I'm just going to leave that out there that both methods um, are valid.